Welcome to a half hour of Mind Webs. Short stories from the worlds of speculative fiction. This story comes from the book A Touch of Strange by Theodore Sturgeon. The story is called Affair with a Green Monkey. There was this trained nurse who retired at 24 to marry a big guy, six foot seven, top brass in a government agency. He was home only weekends. His name was Fritz Rise. About sick people, wrong people, different people, he was a very understanding guy. It was his business to understand them. So one night, he went for a walk with his wife Alma down to this little park on the riverfront where they could get some air. There was a fountain and a bench where they could sit and see the lights across the water and flower beds and all that. And this particular Sunday night, there was a bunch of punks, eight of them, kicking someone to death over by the railing. Fritz Rise understood right away what was happening and what to do. And in three big jumps, he was right in the middle of it. He snatched a hunk of broom handle away from one of the kids just before it got buried in the victim. And then they all saw him, and that was the end of that. They cut out of there, ducking around Alma where she stood as if she was dangerous too. Alma ran over to where Fritz knelt and helped him turn the man over. She got Fritz's display handkerchief and sponged the blood and broken teeth out of the slack mouth and turned the head to one side and did the other things trained nurses are trained to do. Anything broken? She said yes, his arm, maybe internal injuries too. We'd better get an ambulance. Home's quicker... Hey, boy, you're all right now. Up you go. So by the time the man got his eyes open, Fritz had him on his feet. They half carried him up the steps and over the footbridge that crosses the drive, and Fritz was right. They had him back to their apartment 40 minutes sooner than it would have taken to call a wagon. She was going to phone, but he stopped her. We can handle it. Get some pajamas. He looked at the injured man, draped over one big arm. Get some of yours. He, he won't mind. They cleaned him up and splinted the arm. It wasn't so bad, bruises on the ribs and buttocks and in the face, but he was lucky. Give him one week and one dentist and you'll never know it happened. He will. Oh, that, Fritz said. And she said, What do you suppose they did it for? Green monkey. Oh, she said. And they left the man sleeping and went to bed. At five in the morning, Fritz rose quietly and got dressed, and she didn't wake up until he thumped his suitcase down by the bed and bent over to kiss her goodbye. She gave him his kiss, and then came all the way awake and said, Fritz, you're not just leaving like always. He wanted to know why not, and she pointed at the guest room. Leave me with... And he laughed at her. Oh, believe me, honey, you haven't got a thing to worry about. But he... I... Fritz... Look, if anything happens, you can call me. In Washington? She sat up and sort of hugged the sheet around her. Oh, why can't I just send him to a hospital where... Fritz had a way sometimes of being so patient it was insulting. And he said, Because I want to talk to him, help him when he's better, and you know what hospitals are. You just keep him happy and tell him not to leave until I can have a talk with him. Then he said something so gentle and careful that she knew when to shut up. And let's say no more about it, shall we? So she said no more about it, and he went back to Washington. The pajamas were too small for him, but not much, and he was about her age, too. Fritz Rise was quite a bit older. He had a name that she got fond of saying, and small, strong hands. All day, Monday, he was kind of dazed and didn't say much, only smiled thanks for the eggnog and bouillon and bedpan and so on. Tuesday, he was up and about. His clothes were back from the cleaners and mended. He put them on, and they sat around the whole day talking. Elma read books a good deal, and she read aloud to him. She played a lot of music on the phonograph, too. Whatever she liked, he liked even better. 
Wednesday, she took him to the dentist, once in the morning to get the stubs ground down and impressions, and again in the afternoon to have the temporary acrylic cap cemented in. By this time, the lip swelling was all but gone, and with the teeth fixed up, she found herself spending a lot of time just looking at his mouth. His hair shone in the sun, and she half believed it would shine in the dark, too. He somehow never answered her when she wanted to know where he came from. Maybe there was too much laughing going on at the time. They laughed a whole lot together. Anyway, it was some place where you couldn't get spaghetti. She took him to an Italian restaurant for dinner and had to teach him how to spin it on his fork. They had a lot of fun with that, and he ate plenty of it. On Wednesday night, late, she phoned her husband. Alma, what is it? Are you all right? She didn't answer until he called her name twice again, and then she said all whispery. Yes, yes, Fritz, I, I'm all right. Fritz, I'm frightened. Of what? She didn't say anything, though he could hear her trying. Uh, is it, um, uh, what's his name anyway? Lulio. Julio? She sang, Lulio. Well, then what's he done? N nothing. Well, then, are you afraid of anything he might do? Oh, no. You're so right. Alma, I understood that when I left, or he wouldn't be there. Now, then, he hasn't done anything, and you're sure he won't, and I'm sure he won't, so... So why call me up at this time of the night? She didn't say anything. Alma? Fritz? Fritz, come home. Come right home. Now, act your age. Your three minutes are up. Signal went through, please. Yes, operator. Alma, are you calling from an outside phone? Why aren't you home? I couldn't bear to have him hear me. Goodbye, Fritz. He might have said something more to her, but she hung up and went home. On Thursday, she phoned for the car and packed a picnic, and they went to the beach. It was too cold to swim, but they sat in the sand most of the day and talked and sang some. I'm frightened, she said again, but she said it to herself. Once they talked about Fritz, she asked him why those boys had clobbered him, and he said he didn't know. She said, Fritz knew. He says, you're a green monkey. And she explained it. Fritz says, if you catch a monkey in the jungle and paint it green, all the other monkeys will tear it to pieces because it's different. Not dangerous, just different. Different how? Luyo asked in a quiet voice about himself. She had a lot of answers to that, but they were all things of her own, and she didn't mention them. She just said again that Fritz knew. He's going to help you. He looked at her and said, He must be a good man. And she thought that over and said, He's a very understanding man. What does he do in Washington? He's an expert on rehabilitation programs. Rehabilitation of what? People. Oh, now I'm looking forward to Saturday. And she told him, I love you. He turned to her as she sat round-eyed, all her left knuckles in her mouth so that the ring hurt her. You don't mean that. I didn't mean to say it. After that, and on Friday, they stayed together, but like the wires on your lamp cord, never touching. They went to the zoo, where Lulio looked at the animals excited as a child, except the monkeys, which made them be quiet and go quickly to something else. The longer the day got, the quieter they were together. And at dinner, they said almost nothing. And after that, they even stopped looking at each other. That night, when it was darkest, she went to his room and opened the door and closed it again behind her. She did not turn on the light, and she said, I don't care. I don't care. And wept in a whisper. Lulio was alone in the apartment when Fritz came home shopping, he answered the big man's question. Good afternoon, Mr. Riza. Glad to see you. Fritz, instructed Fritz. You're looking chipper. Alma been good to you? Julio smiled enough to light up the place. What'd you say your name was? Uh, Julio? Oh, yeah. Lulio. 
I remember. Well, Lou, my lad, let's have our little talk. Now sit down over there and let me have a good look at you. He took a good long look and then grunted and nodded, satisfied. Are you ashamed of yourself, boy? What? Uh, ashamed? Uh, no, I don't think so. Good. That means this doesn't have to be a long talk at all. Just uh, make it even shorter. I want you to know from the start that that I know what you are, and you don't have to hide it. It doesn't matter damn to me, and I'm not going to pry, okay? You know? Fritz boomed a big laugh. <laughs> don't worry so, Louie. Everybody you meet doesn't see what I see. It's my business to see these things and understand them. Julio shifted nervously. What things are you talking about? Uh, shape of the hands, the way you walk, the way you sit, the way you show your feelings, sound of your voice, lots more. They're all small things. Any one or two or six might mean nothing. But all together, I'm on to you. I understand you. I'm not asking, I'm telling. And I don't care. It's just that I can tell you how to behave so you don't get mobbed again. You want to hear it or don't you? Julio didn't look a thing in the world but puzzled. Fritz stood up and pulled off his jacket and shirt and threw them on the corner of the couch and fell back in the big chair, altogether relaxed. He began to talk like a man who loves talking and who knows what to say because he's said it all before, knows he's right, knows he says it well. A lot of people live among people all their lives and never find out this one simple thing about people. Human beings cease to be human when they congregate. And a mob's a monster. Now, you, if you think of a mob as a living thing and you want to get its IQ, take the average intelligence of the people there and divide it by the number of people there. Which means that a mob of 50 has somewhat less intelligence than an earthworm. No one person could sink to its level of cruelty and lack of principle. It thinks that anything that is different is dangerous. And it thinks it's protecting itself by tearing anything that's different to small bloody bits. The difference which is dangerous changes with the times. Men have been mob murdered for wearing beards and for not wearing beards. For saying the right series of words and what the mob thinks is the wrong order. For wearing or... Or not wearing this or that article of clothing or tattoo or piece of skin. That's ugly, said Lulio. That's ugly, Fritz repeated with completely accurate, completely insulting mimicry and then made his big roar of laughter and told Lulio not to get mad. You've just made a point for me, but, but wait a bit till I get to it, okay? He leaned back and went on with his speech. Now, of all dangerous differences which incite the mob, the one that hits them hardest, quickest, and nastiest is any variation in sex. It devolves upon every human being to determine which sex he belongs to, and then to, to be that as loud as possible for as long as he lives. To the smallest detail, men dress like men, and women dress like women, and God help them if they cross the line. A man has got to look and act like a man. That isn't a right, it's a duty. And no matter how weird mankind gets in its rules and regulations, whether manhood demands shoulder-length hair for a cavalier, or waist-length for a Sikh, or a crew cut for a Bavarian, the rules must be followed or bloody well else. Now, as for you people... Fritz said, sitting up and flipping his long index finger down and forward like a sharpshooter practicing the snapshot. As for you people, you are what you are just like everybody else. But I'm not talking about what you are. That's self-evident. Only about how you're treated. The only big difference between you and normal people in those terms is that they must display their sex and insist on it. And you may not. But I mean, you 100% by God may not, not in public. Among your own kind, you can camp and scream and giggle to your heart's content. But don't let yourself get caught at it. It would be better not to do it at all. Now, wait, wait, wait. Hold on there. What has this got to do with me? Fritz opened his eyes big and round and then closed them and slumped into the cushions. 
He said in a very, very tired voice, Oh, now, look it. You're not going to bust into the middle of this and make me go all the way back to the beginning, are you? I just want to know what makes you think. Sit down and shut up. Do you or do you not want to know how to go about among human beings without getting your girlish face kicked down your throat? Lulio stood for a while, pale, his bright eyes drawn down to angry slits. It was as if Fritz's question didn't reach him all at once and had to percolate in. Slowly, he sat down again. Go ahead, then. Fritz nodded approvingly. I hate a bad liar, Louie. And you were about to try the one lie you could never get away with. Not with anyone who understands you. All right, then. My advice to you, be a man. Not any old man. Not mankind, but manhood. And to do this, you don't need to play pro football and grow hair on your chest and seduce every third woman you meet as long as she's female. All you have to do is hunt, fish, or talk sense about them as if you had, and go bug-eyed when the girls go by. If a sunset moves you so much you have to express yourself, do it with a grunt and a dirty word. Or you say, that Beethoven, he blows a really cool symphony. And never champion a real underdog unless it's a popular type like a baseball team. And always treat other men as if you were sore at something and will wipe it off on them if they give you the slightest excuse. And I mean sore, Louie, not vexed or in a snit. And stay away from women. They have an intuition that'll find you out nine times out of ten. And the tenth time she falls for you. And there's nothing funnier. Julio said after a time, I think that you hate human beings. Now, I understand them, that's all. Do you think I hate you? Maybe you should. I'm not what you think I am. Fritz Rise shook his head and quietly cursed. <sighs> all right, all right. Wear your cellophane mask if it makes you feel better. I don't give a damn about you or what you do. Do what I tell you, and you can live in a man's world. Go on the way you are, and in that last split second before they kick your brains in, you'll admit I was right. I'm glad you told me. It's what I came here to find out. At the sound of a key in the lock, Fritz sprang up and ran to the door. It was Elma. Fritz took her packages and kissed her. And while he was kissing her, she looked past him to the living room and Lulio. And as soon as he was finished, she went and stood in the doorway. Fritz stood behind her, watching. Lulio raised his head slowly and saw her and started and smiled shyly. Fritz stepped up and took her shoulder and turned her around because just then he had to see her face. When he saw it, he gently bit his lower lip and said, Oh, and went back to his chair. He was a man who understood things real quick. Alma ignored him, all eyes for Lulio. What has he been saying to you? He didn't answer. He looked at the carpet. Fritz jumped up and rapped. Well, are you going to tell the lady? Why? Promise me you will. Every word, every word, and I'll let her take the car and give you a lift out of town. You are from out of town. Yes? Well, I think you owe it to each other. What do you say, Louie? Fritz, have you gone cr You better persuade him to play it that way, honey. It's the last chance you'll have to see him alone. Lulio, she whispered. Lulio, come on, then. Lulio stared at the big man. Fritz grinned and said, Every goddamn word, mind you, Louie. I'll quiz her when she gets back and take it out on her if you don't. Alma, try not to make it more than two or three hours, okay? Come on, then, she said stiffly, and they went out. Fritz went and got a beer and came back and flopped in the chair, drinking and laughing and scratching his chest. In the car, he said only, uptown, over the bridge, and then fell into a silence that lasted clear to the toll booths. They turned north, and at last he began to talk. He told her all about it, 
She said nothing until he had quite finished. Then, how could you let him suggest such a filthy thing? He laughed bitterly. Let him? When he understands something, that is it. There was nothing she could say to this. She knew it better than anything in life. He said, But I guess I'm a green monkey anyhow. Well, I should be grateful. He told me where my kind can hide and how to act when we're out in the open. I'd about given up. What do you mean? He would not answer her, but rode with his face turned away. He seemed to be scanning the roadside to the right. And suddenly, Here, here, stop here. And startled, she pulled off the pavement and stopped. There's a new parkway north of the bridge, and for miles it parallels the old road. Between them is a useless strip of land, mauled by construction machines, weedy and deserted. She looked at it and at him, and if she was going to speak again, the expression on his face stopped her. It was filled with sadness and longing and something else, a sort of blue mood and laughter. He said, I'm going home now. She looked at her hands on the wheel and suddenly could not see them. He touched her arm and said gently, You'll have to get over it, Alma. It can't work. Nothing could make it work. It would kill you. And try to get back with your husband. He's better equipped for you. I'm not. Not at all. Stop it, she whispered. Stop it. Stop it. Luyo sighed deeply, put his arms around her, and kissed her. Rough, gentle. Thorough face, mouth, tongue, ears, neck, touching her body hungrily while he did it. She clung to him and cried. He put her arms from him and pressed something into her hand and vaulted out of the car, ran across the shoulder, jumped over the retaining wall, and disappeared. It was only a low wall. He didn't disappear behind anything or into anything or in the distance. He just disappeared. She called him twice and then got out and ran to the wall. Nothing. Weeds, broken ground, a bush or two. She wrung her hands and became conscious of the object he had given her. It was a transparent disc, about like a plain, flat flashlight lens. She turned it over twice, then impulsively looked through it. She saw Lulio crouched in a machine. She saw the machine leave, and when it was gone, her glass disc ceased to exist also so that she had nothing of his anymore. For a while she thought she could not survive that. And in its time came the thing known to everyone who has had grief enough that no matter what you've lost, the lungs and the heart go on and all around birds fly, cars pass, people make a buck and lose their souls and get hernia and happy and their hair cut just like before. When she came through the other side of this, it was quite a bit later. She was weak and numb, but she could drive again, so she did, very carefully. And soon she was able to think again, so she did, just as carefully. And by the time she got home, her rehearsed, Hello, was perfect and easy. Maybe she forgot to rehearse her face. Fritz Rise, shirtless, huge and understanding, came up out of the big chair like a cresting wave of muscles and kindliness. He took her hand and laughed quietly and brought her to the couch. She cowered back into the corner cushions and just sat, waiting for him to wash over her any way he wanted. He sat on the edge of the couch close to her, leaning forward to wall her away from the world, his heavy forearm and fists on the end table next to the couch. Single-handedly, he surrounded her. Alma, he whispered, and waited, waited, until at last she met his eyes. Alma, I'm not angry. Believe me, honey, I'm glad you can love someone that much. It only means you're alive and compassionate. And, Alma, he laughed the quiet laugh again. Of course, I'll admit I'm glad he turned out to be a... One of the girls. I don't know what I'd do if you ever felt that way about a real man. Her eyes had been fixed on his all the while. And now she moved them, let them drop to the heavy naked forearm which lay across the polished wood of the end table. 
She watched it with increasing fascination as he talked. So, let's chalk up one for the statistical mind, namely me, versus feminine intuition, which sort of let you down. What are you staring at? She was staring at the forearm. Almost in spite of herself, she reached for it. She didn't answer. He said, uh, It could have been worse. Elma, imagine living with him. Imagine getting right to the point, drunk on poetry and shiny hair, and just when you were... Uh, um, why go on? It'd be impossible. It was impossible, she said in a low voice. She put her hand on his forearm, looked up and saw him watching her, and snatched the hand away self-consciously. She couldn't seem to keep her eyes off his arm, and she began to smile, looking at it. Fritz was a big man, and his forearm was about 17 inches long and perhaps five and a half inches thick. Quite impossible, she murmured. And that's about the size of it. Damn near exactly the size of it, she thought wildly. Good girl. Now I'll give you 48 hours mooning time and then we'll be... His voice trailed off weakly as he watched the wildness transfer itself from somewhere inside her to her face and turned to laughter, floods, arrows, flights, peals, bullets of laughter. Alma! Her laughter ceased instantly, but left her lips curled and her eyes glittering. You better go back to killing the green monkeys. You've given them a beachhead. What? There's something awfully small about you, Fritz Rise. And again came the laughter, more and more of it. And he couldn't croon it down, he couldn't shout it down, and he couldn't stand it. He got dressed and packed his bag and said from the door into the blare and blaze of her laughter, I, I don't understand you, I don't understand you at all. And he went back to Washington. That story was Affair with a Green Monkey by Theodore Sturgeon. It appears in his book, A Touch of Strange. This is Michael Hansen speaking. Technical production on this program by Leslie Hilsenhoff and Steve Gordon. Mindwebs is a production of WHA Radio in Madison a service of University of Wisconsin Extension. Thank you.